So I'm going to tell you about something which is in the United States sort of called extended MHD, which includes resistive MHD, that is to say MHD adding resistivity. It includes neoclassical MHD, which is adding uh, parallel viscous forces, which we'll talk about. And it includes the two fluid effects that Javier uh, Garbet was talking about. And uh, it's kind of the new vernacular or way of describing a kind of extended MHD model that, that encompasses as much as we can out of the fluid moments. Then we'll discuss briefly a little bit about the, MA, the constraints that these MHD high uh, fast processes cause. And then ultimately, we'd like to know, OK, what's the self-consistent transport equations across magnetic field lines? I'll refer to those pictures a little bit later. So first, we'll talk about how we get the extended MHD from the fluid moment equations, then about the ideal MHD model, uh, its possible instabilities and consequences, and then axisymmetric toroidal geometry, how are we going to do the uh, mathematics of those flux surfaces, then neoclassical stress or viscous force closures for tokamak plasmas, the natural plasma currents and flows in tokamaks, and finally tokamak plasma transport equations. So um, again, this is just a reminder for a moment of these fluid moment equations, which you've been seeing all week long. <laughs> in various contexts, sometimes with various terms, sometimes without, and sometimes specialized. But they really are for uh, a given species, electrons or ions, uh, our starting point for fluid moment descriptions. And of course, highlighted in red and some form of purple um, are the uh, uh, closure relations or collisional uh, closures that we will need. But really, um, originally in, in early studies of plasma physics, and even now, a lot of what we try to do is to make sure that the fluid of the whole plasma uh, descript, we have that right, and we call that, of course, MHD, magnetohydrodynamics. So how do you get from these equations, the um, equations for density, momentum, and entropy or energy. I'm going to use entropy today, um, to the collisional entropy, I should say, uh, to flu uh, extended MHD equations. Well, you can just take the density equation, and what you do is you say, well, I'd like to have not the density of one species, electrons or ions, but I'd like to have the whole mass density so I'll add it up, and that's mostly the ions because the ions are 3,600 times, 3,672 times the electron. So it's mostly, and the electron density is about the ion density for quasi-neutrality. And then we define a mass flow velocity. Most of the mass is carried by the ions, so, and most of the flow is carried by the ions. And then a current density between electrons and ions, and a capital P will represent the total plasma pressure, both electrons and ions. And then likewise, a total stress tensor, which sums over electron stresses and ion stresses. And again, because the ions are more massive, they tend to give you the dominant uh, stresses. So when you do that, and I won't go through this in detail, you end up with what I will call extended MHD equations. And actually, I think it's better if I take this one up and this one down so you can see it better. But anyway. So the extended MHD equations, uh, the mass density, you just sum the two electron and ion densities, and you get this. If you um, 
multiply by the charge instead of the mass, you get the charge continuity equation, divergence J equals zero. Remember, we're doing mostly non-relativistic. So you might say, well, I should have a D charge density D rho DT, but pragmatically, we're always quasi-neutral and so forth, so to lowest order. So we don't need to worry about that. And also, we can look at the non-relativistic Ampere's law. If, if we take its divergence, we get divergence J equals zero. So actually, our charge continuity equation is the same as divergence J equals zero. Momentum equation, we add together the um, electron and ion ones. And because the electron momentum is equal to minus the ion momentum, when we add them together, that vanishes. And likewise, NQE vanishes by quasi-neutrality. But we do end up with J cross V minus gradient of now total pressure, electron plus ion pressure, plus the divergence of the stress within the whole species, mostly ions. And then, so for the, this was summing together. We actually get the Ohm's law by just, oh, and I see I did not put the inertia term in here. I should have put the inertia term in. Anyway, we just take the uh, electron momentum equation, and uh, I should have kept this term and stuck it on the right-hand side. And you just divide through by any uh, E, and you get E is equal to minus V cross B, if I remember to write a minus sign. Uh, yeah, uh, and uh, the friction between the species and divergence of pi and so forth. And then you take the entropy equations for each and you just sum them and basically you're going to get that the, um, the time rate of change of the uh, now total plasma entropy is equal to all of these entropy producing processes, heat conduction against gradients, viscous dissipation, electron ion energy transfers, and sources of energy in the plasma, neutral beam heating, et cetera, et cetera. So this is what we can call the extended MHD equations. And then, however, the dissipated processes due to collisions, the uh, frictional force R and the stress pi, uh, which will be ending up being both proportional to collision frequency, are in some sense slow time scale, at least compared to the waves that will come out of the momentum equation called the Alphane waves. So we have an ideal MHD description. Ideal means no entropy production, no, uh, none of these collisional or viscous effects. So all the red terms here and the red and sort of purple <laughs> terms here and the entropy production is zero. So we just have d by dt of p over rho to the gamma, which is pv to the gamma, if you wish, uh, effectively. We'll come back to that. So um, in ideal MHD, then, we neglect uh, all of those colored terms. And then when we... Uh, then what we care about is that the electric field uh, will now only, uh, well, and, and we neglect this because this is a diamagnetic flow term. And so to lowest order, the electric field is just V cross V. This is a two fluid effect, effectively, uh, that uh, Javier Garbet was talking about and is a slower time scale than regular ideal MHD. I didn't quite explain that right. Now, so then we can use Faraday's law, say dB dt is curl of E when we do so, the, and E is just minus V cross B, we get dB dt is equal to the curl of V cross B. And this is the vector representation, it turns out, of flow um, in a magnetic field that is, uh, well, anyway, uh, which said it's the vector equivalent of V dot del V, if you work out the V dot del V uh, of fluid dynamics, and, but with a magnetic field. And what it says is, if the magnetic field is, wig or if the flows are wiggling, it will carry the magnetic field with it, right with it. It advex it with it properly. 
in a vectorial sense. And so if you calculate the flux uh, as a total time derivative of a, of, a, of a given amount of magnetic flux, you find that it vanishes. And this is very analogous to the Kelvin circulation theorem in standard hydrodynamics. Uh, it's the magnetic, uh, it's the MHD version. So what happens then is in ideal MHD, the, fl the flow fluctuations cause magnetic field to follow right with it, so to speak. They don't transport relative to each other. The field lines just do this. So then you say, well, I'll make perturbations. And there are a number of types of MHD waves that come up. The first one is the compressional alphane wave, which is sometimes called the fast uh, compressional alphane wave. And if you have a magnetic field in this direction, they're basically waves propagating perpendicular to that. <coughs> Uh, then you have shear or torsional, ones that twist the magnetic field because they're moving down the field and twisting. Um, and those are incompressible waves propagating along the magnetic field. And then uh, those are shear torsional waves. You can have parallel sound waves, which are compressible waves along the field line. And uh, here's the alphane speed, and here's the sound speed. Usually in our plasmas, the, sound, the alphane speed is greater than the sound speed, but it's less than the electron thermal speed, but anyway. So in tokamak plasmas, we usually have C alphane is the sound speed divided by the square root of beta, ratio of plasma pressure to magnetic pressure, um, which is much greater than the sound speed. Now, these compressional waves, what they mainly do is on a very fast time scale, microseconds, they enforce radial force balance in the plasma. And so they will give us radial force balance on the next slide. But you can have shear and sound waves can be uh, unstable. And we'll talk about that on the next graph. And they produce limits on how much plasma you pressure you can put in or the twist of the field lines. So Again, on compressional alphane wave time scales, you insist upon ideal MHD equilibrium. So if you look at the uh, ideal MHD force balance, if we're in equilibrium, this vanishes. And I just get J cross B equals grad P. Uh, to lowest order, I don't worry about the viscosity because that's a longer time scale process. And so my ideal MHD equilibrium will be described by J cross B equals grad P J equals curl of B and divergence B equals zero. Now, if we had uh, shear alphane waves which were unstable, and they, can, uh, they would lead to, and do, <laughs> to very rapid growing instabilities, microseconds, tens of microseconds. Um, and we actually have modes in tokamaks that grow in 50 to 100 or maybe 200 microseconds if you put too much pressure in the plasma. You produce the equivalent of a Rayleigh-Taylor instability. It's an analogous instability. Um, it's a sound wave instability if you put in too much pressure, roughly speaking, 10%. And there are large codes that uh, look at this in great detail because the details depend upon the detailed pressure profiles, current profiles, and so forth. The other type of um, instability is a so-called kink instability, the criteria for which were developed in the 50s by Kruskal and Shafranov. And the idea is we're going to have, if you remember, our field lines are going to be helically twisted and the idea is that if you um, try to twist them too much, roughly speaking, such that they just once around kind of come back on themselves by a parameter we call Q, the safety factor, it has to be greater than one, really more like two or three. But, but anyway, uh, those are kink instabilities. When those instabilities are unstable, the plasma's over with, okay, <laughs> from a tokamak standpoint. 
And, and you, you know, you, if you drive up the plasma pressure, you can actually see these instabilities as you go through the, the threshold, and they kill you. They kill the whole plasma within four, 400 microseconds in some D3D cases we did. So the moral to the story here is don't do that. <laughs> we, that is to say, uh, the experimentalists learn where their boundaries are, and they stay away from those instabilities. If we want to go more than a, you know, half, a sec or a half a millisecond, actually, we have to obey those MHD criteria, the big codes to do that properly. So from now on, I will presume we stay low enough pressure, high enough, uh, high enough Q, which means weak uh, rotational transform of the, of the field lines, weak helices. So some other comments. Um, the MHD equilibrium, we, we are going to describe two, okay, because we have these helical field lines, we're going to describe two types of magnetic flux. And I got my little diagrams over here. So imagine this is, you know, a tokamak going around. We're going to have a toroidal direction around inside the donut and a poloidal this direction. So for the poloidal magnetic flux to any given point, we just put a point back to the magnetic axis and we ask how much field is going through this surface. For the toroidal, we just draw a surface here and we say how much magnetic flux is going through that. It turns out that all of, a large fraction of the way we describe the magnetic configuration is based on the poloidal magnetic flux, which um, is, is just you know, a poloidal uh, component of the poloidal field. And it turns out that can be written, uh, that poloidal field, in terms of the toroidal vector potential. And perhaps I should have indicated uh, we use from the magnetic axis a distance, uh, that's our major radius r, six meters or so in ether. Again, I use ether type numbers. Now, the toroidal magnetic field, you tend to think of uh, being created by external magnetic field coils, and so the toroidal magnetic field will decrease as one over r, but it turns out r times that is a parameter we call capital I. It's actually a poloidal current. And so we tend to write the magnetic field awkwardly is the word I would use in terms of both a covariant base vector and a contravariant base vector. So it's mixed co-count or co-contravariant uh, <laughs> base vectors. But we could, it turns out we'll be able to also write it in a totally contravariant form, grad psi poloidal times grad Q, which is the uh, straight, uh, the um, safety factor, or it's one over the rotational transform of the field lines, the twist of them, one over that twist. Okay, so if you take this mixed covariant, uh, contravariant covariant base vector, you take its curl, you get something and you get a, not Laplacian operator, but you get a cylindrical-like operator uh, where the sign is wrong inside. So this is Z and zeta is my toroidal angle. Um, and so you get uh, a, a magnetic uh, 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 second-order operator and then you say, well, my MHD was that I needed to have J cross B equals grad P for my equilibrium. You take B dot grad P and you say, oh, well, that has to be zero. Therefore, wherever the magnetic field lines are going, and they're axisymmetric, the pressure has to be constant on those poloidal flux surfaces. Likewise, the current uh, has to be perpendicular to that. And so this turns out to say that this quantity RB toroidal whole goes like a flux function. And you put that together with um, this relation up here. And you say, well, the radial component of J cross B and the radial component of grad P give you an equation which is commonly called the grad Stefanov equation. This is a elliptic 
second order differential equation, but it's really a nonlinear elliptic differential equation because I have to specify a pressure function. And you know, I have pressure high in the middle of the plasma and low on the outside, so I have some functional form of psi. So I've got psi over here and psi over here. And I is a current function, uh, and so it'll also have a, poly a dependence. Um, now, it turns out that you can, uh, the, the, you, you, a lot of uh, analysis is done uh, on codes this way. Analytically, you can prove that for some simple pressure or um, poloidal current uh, functions, uh, you can you know, make it linear and you can solve it, make it nonlinear as long, long as the pressure is not too high, you can solve it, and so forth and so on. But frankly, it's usually solved numerically. And in particular, what you want to do, we're going to do transport later relative to these nested flux surfaces by axisymmetry. They're nest, they're, you know, just going around. Um, and so you'd really like to know in the plasma, okay, they have so-called Thompson scattering. And they can measure the temperature right here and density. Well, but the, what I want to know as a theorist is which flux surface are you on? And so you have to be able to map a real spatial position, major radius from the axis and, and vertical distance, to that point. So you have to have a separate program to solve this Gradschuk-Ranov equation. And you have to iterate, because you say, well, I think the pressure sort of looks like this, because I got a certain, certain number of points where I have the temperature and density. And then I calculate the flux surfaces, and that wasn't quite right. And so I go back and forth, and I have to iterate so that I can tell what I have as real information. But that's done, and that's not too much of a problem. And here, actually, I show this just to say I'm kind of an old guy, OK? How about a paper in 1972? <laughs> And we actually did numerical solutions of the Gradschuk-Ranov equation. And uh, my, my colleague was the numericist, and I was the analytics guy who had a, tech, a teletype terminal to uh, uh, do these things. Uh, it, it was way old. Successive over relaxation method on a nonlinear elliptic equation. Anyway, so you could calculate the pressure surfaces. Here's the simple case of, you know, round ones. Uh, magnetic flux surfaces. B toroidal falls off like 1 over R. But if you have a twist of the current, okay, twist of the field lines and twist of the parallel current, perpendicular currents are smaller, lo and behold, the current is such as to increase the magnetic field where the plasma is. So it's paramagnetic. Um, at low beta poloidal ratio of pressure to, to poloidal magnetic field energy. There's a certain place beta poloidal one, whereby uh, you're nested a little bit out, and this is called the Shafranoff shift, the nesting of the float surfaces outward. And if you go up to beta poloidal of order the aspect ratio, you shifted so much and dug yourself a diamagnetic well, it turns out. So the toroidal magnetic field is not just 1 over R, but it has a dip where the plasma is. All this stuff is kind of important in real plasmas and to get the magnetic equilibrium right. Okay, So this is a background of something that you have to do for experimental data analysis. And, but, and part of it is their, their real flux surfaces are more complicated. Namely, they want to have this diverter X point down here. Okay, You can see that right, right down here in the bottom. And so the idea is that uh, you, you want to have the plasma flow out, and once it gets to the separatrix, it kind of goes down here, and then you've got big pumps and stuff down here where you can handle the high flux of heat, number of particles, and pump them away, hopefully. You can't really see, but there's some diverter hardware down here to do that sort of thing. Now, the difference then from... Um, okay, this was a very simple, this was the illustration, the, the, the real numerical stuff's in that paper. But anyway, this is a schematic illustration 
But as you can see, I, we were doing uh, fixed boundary conducting wall boundary conditions, uh, which was what was done on the T3 tokamak, the original one. It was a copper shell about yay thick. So <laughs> yeah, it was a conducting wall boundary condition. But that's not what we have. We have a free boundary. So that's a complication. It's a nonlinear partial differential equation with uh, surfaces outside. Uh, it has an embedded magnetic separatrix, so you've got some poloidal field coils, as they're called, going around toroidally that cause you to have that magnetic X point. And, but it's still, it's axisymmetric, you know, around the toroidal direction. So it's a two-dimensional magnetic geometry. And so this gradch fanov equation is, nowadays, always just solved numerically. So, uh, so the moral to this story along the ideal MHD line is, one, you can't afford to have the MHD instabilities. They will kill you, quit. So if we want to get out to six seconds on ETER, we've got to avoid those boundaries. Secondly, we solve the gradge Franoff equation to get the magnetic equilibrium. Yes. Yeah. It may have different solutions. So, so it's clear, for example, if the second derivative of T right. the potential is not lower or not enough, I don't remember exactly the condition. Okay? Yeah. Then there may be other equilibrium other nearby. Solutions. So mathematically it is correct, but is, is it relevant for the, <laughs> for the physics or for what you We always worry about it, but we don't do anything about it. <laughs> <laughs> no, but okay. Pragmatically, I should say, um, the way, for example, a, a program called EFIT used at General Atomics and some places else in the world solves is not by solving for poloidal flux as a function of R and Z, but the inverse problem, R and Z as a function of poloidal flux and an angle. And the inverse process you can show as a variational process. You can make it into a variational process. And so by that, we, uh, we, we think we've gotten the best solution. However, I would have to say, when you go to high plasma pressure compared to the poloidal magnetic field and a diverter X point, and you really push it, you worry about it. <laughs> uh, Usually we avoid such problems <laughs> by staying away from quite such high beta poloidals. We have other things that kill us before then, <laughs> usually. The equilibrium usually doesn't kill us. It doesn't give us two equilibria. Indeed, if you look at this little diagram here on my uh, right-hand side, there were people who did uh, mathematical analyses before we did this paper and said, well, if you exceed beta poloidal greater than the aspect ratio, uh, there's no solution or there's multiple solutions, and et cetera. We usually have problems before we get that high. <laughs> so we're lucky. I, uh, <coughs> so our equilibrium tends not to be uh, our problem. OK, so that's ideal MHD. Next subject. So now let's go a little longer in time scale. Namely, we start allowing for collisional processes for time scales longer than one over the collision frequency, uh, collision rate, and um, again, the ETER numbers, that's 200 microseconds. So longer than 200 microseconds, you know, 10 times longer or something, you start getting resistivity. Okay, what does resistivity allow us to do? Resistivity allows you to tear the magnetic field lines on rational surfaces. Remember we had the dBdt was curl of V cross B. It turns out you work that out, and it's the parallel derivative of the flow. But the parallel derivative vanishes on a rational surface. If you have a, a rational surface, a 2-1 surface, you follow around the torus, and you come back on yourself after two times toroidally. So it goes around like this and it comes back on itself. That's a position that's um, vulnerable to small perturbations and also 
it's a place where you can actually tear the field lines or reconnect them. And actually, you can create two types of reconnection phenomena, two types of instabilities, it turns out, two types of tearing instabilities at those rational surfaces. Some are current gradient driven, and those are what's known as classical tearing modes, first Killeen and Rosenbluth in 62. And then there's neoclassical tearing modes, which are pressure gradient driven by the bootstrap current. And uh, my colleague and I wrote a lot of papers on these neoclassical tearing modes. Pragmatically, what happens is that if a neoclassical tearing mode in particular gets going, you get up high enough pressure, uh, beta n it's called 2, uh, beta poloidal about 2, you start building up a magnetic island in the plasma. This is a magnetic island that's twisting around with 2-1 pitch. Okay? Now what would that do to you? That would say heat put here comes out when it hits the separatrix, it kind of jumps across the X point region. So roughly speaking, this region where the island is, is not a good confinement zone. It's the same as having heat go through that wall and you put a nice big hole in the wall and you let all the heat go through that hole, okay? Worse than that, many times these neoclassical tearing modes, if they occur in a tokamak, and they do, they really do, They've been seen in five, ten tokamaks throughout the world. If they occur, they often are growing in time. So not only is there an island, it's actually growing in time, and eventually it hits the wall. It causes a, a distortion of the whole plasma that bumps into the wall. So the answer is, just like ideal MHD, we can't allow this. Okay, because they would stop us at in where we saw them originally in TFTR uh, in about 30 milliseconds, or in the case of ITER, it might be a, a second or so. But anyway, or even five or ten seconds. So this puts it turns out cons uh, constraints on the type of current profile you can have toroidal current in the plasma. Well, we, we drive toroidal current with the inductive field. You, you can't have too much current gradient and you can't have too much pressure gradient. So, and again, if these islands happen, uh, you can tolerate a little bit of an island, uh, but not big islands. And so what they do, actually, is we're going to talk about the bootstrap current and such. They allow for a certain, this brings up when you put up the pressure gradient, you create more bootstrap current. When that gets too large, then you get these instabilities. So you put in another current source in the plasma, which is all called electron cyclotron current drive. And you actually uh, op act opposite to the bootstrap current and cause the island to shrink. It's done experimentally and it's quite successful. So, these modes are deleterious when they happen, not good things. And so uh, these extended MHD equations, which include through, through this term right here, we'll see the bootstrap current, um, they uh, yield prescriptions for, well, how far you can go, or the, that's your limit. And then what we get into, so we say, okay, we cannot have ideal MHD instabilities. We'll stay below boundaries. We cannot have these tearing modes of, we can stand little ones, but not big ones. So we have control mechanisms for that. But again, we want to get out to six second confinement times, so we have to control these. So anyway, but then on this same time scale of these uh, uh, collisional effects, uh, they have additional effects, and that's what we, even after we don't allow these instabilities, they have additional effects. Now, I chose a wrong analogy I decided here, but <laughs> anyway. So, let's suppose I have a magnetic field going in this direction, down and forming magnetic bumps, 
So it's a bumpy cylinder. So the magnetic field lines are going this way, okay? And imagine an analogy to flow down a bumpy pipe. How would I calculate the transport of that momentum that I put a flow across to the wall? Well, you would say, okay, I got a flow and I've got some perpendicular viscosity to the perpendicular to the direction and it'll just diffuse out. That's what the Braginsky or collisional equations do for you. They say, I got flow in this direction, but I'll diffuse it radially and so forth. But Braginsky and such ideas are short collision lengths compared to, say, the bumpiness of this, of this field or this bumpy cylinder. What happens, people call it the Newton number, but anyway, what happens when the collision length is longer than the bumps? Well, hmm, first thing that happens is you say, well, I probably got to average over to bumps, okay? And roughly speaking, what happens is if I'm uh, in a bumpy cylinder, magnetic cylinder, I'm destined to go along the field lines, but if my collision length is very long, then I've got to average over those length scales, okay? So then my net diffusion, or net transport, is the collision rate times the bumpy length, okay? So uh, again, if it's short collision length, that just use regular viscosity, perpendicular, you know, isotropic diffusion. But on long collisions, uh, when I have a magnetic field, then my viscous damping rate or diffusivity goes like collision frequency times the bumpiness length. And uh, so the, uh, what's going to happen is my directed momentum is going to get relaxed instead of over the collision like lambda naught, it's going to be relaxed at a rate viscous diffusion times the second derivative along a field line. Didn't need another V there. Anyway, uh, so it's like the collision frequency times the parallel length scale times the parallel gradient of the velocity. Got an extra V in there. So basically, Remember, our tokamaks had collision lengths of 300 to 1,000 times the periodicity lengths. So very long parallel collision lengths. So what's going to happen is we're going to have to go into this long mean free path, or I prefer to call it collision, long collision length uh, analysis. And what we're going to have to do is say, well, gee, this is of order, this, this viscous damping rate parallel viscous damping rate, which is like the collision frequency, is going to be on about the same order as the resistivity. So this is actually going to cause the parallel resistivity of the plasma to change. So let's talk a little bit about this, uh, the parallel stress, uh, the stress tensor. Just like we had in Braginsky magnetic field, we got parallel heat conduction is fantastic. Cross is perpendicular, B cross grad P is a diamagnetic flow. That's sort of down four, five, six orders of magnitude. And then transport across field lines is down another factor of that. So 10 orders of magnitude. So the stresses are along field lines, across field lines, and perpendicular to field lines. And they scale, roughly speaking, as the parallel stress is collision frequency times the collision length, del parallel V, uh, the, B, the diamagnetic type B cross grad P, well, B cross grad flow velocity. And this is of order rho star compared to that, one, one part in 10 to the 3, whereas pi perp is one part in 10 to the, uh, well, 10 to the minus 6, so very small. So what we need to do is take account of this parallel bumpiness, okay? So we'll concentrate on the parallel uh, uh, stress. And uh, Javier Garbet was mentioning er uh, yesterday that we need to cal cal take account of this pi cross or this diamagnetic flow or when you take its divergence, 
what's called the gyroviscous stress effect, which has the way of canceling the flow into a E cross B dot, anyway. Gyroviscous cancellation is called. And I might say, in the codes Nimrod, M3D, C1, and actually Jordic, all implement now uh, Jesus Ramos's extremely complicated pies. They grudgingly have put it all in. That's the only way I can describe it. So they can get their two fluid stuff right. Anyway, Braginsky gives you, again, in the limit that lambda is small compared to the gradient scale lengths, it gives you a, uh, a stress, okay, with these numerical coefficients uh, for ZI, for ions, uh, Z equals one. But that's not valid, Braginsky's not valid when the collision length is much longer than these periodicity lengths. So what do you do? Well, first you say, well, really, uh, the parallel stress is an isotropic function given by the rate of strain along the field lines. Grad B is rate of strain. W is, is the, um, what do you call it, uh, symmetrized version and uh, with, with some coefficient. And we can calculate this rate of strain and it's flow dot grad B. Ah, so that's flow. Grad B means, you know, if I did this to the field line, magnetic field was low between the two bumps, but it's high at the top of the bump. So my magnetic field is increasing. Then you end up with some terms that lo and behold are compressibility, no magnetic monopoles, and this actually is again advection of the plasma fluid with the magnetic field of the magnetic field with the plasma fluid. And so lo and behold, in, uh, after, after you get the fast time, time scale compression allow fame wave and sound wave relaxations, remember I got rid of all stability in that range. Then uh, those terms kind of all go away, and all you end up with is a parallel stress, which is driven by flows along mod magn magnitude of the magnetic field. And as the magnetic field does this, it's going up in magnitude. It's converging. So you can write that the divergence of the str uh, parallel stress is some, you can write it all out as curvature, grad log B, and so forth. And B dot del dot pi looks like this. And, uh, our organizer, Boniface uh, and Kanga, doesn't like this form, but as a theorist, I love it. Um, I like to take the flux surface average. So that just averages over the bounce length. Remember, I got my bumpy cylinder. I'll average over the periodicity length. When you're doing an ideal or extended MHD code, any MHD code, you'd like to have everything local, all quantities local. But as a theorist, if you want to calculate these things, you say, no, no, I want to average it over a, over a, bounce, over, over a periodicity length. And so this is what we write, <laughs> okay? And um, uh, uh, instead of a local uh, B dot del, because we can calculate the pi parallel coefficient in a bounce average sense, a periodicity length scale average, uh, flux surface average, much easier. And so, not just Boniface, but <laughs> um, the Nimrod people and the M3DC1 people, all the extended MHD guys who run these codes say, give me a local thing. And so we cobble together some forms that kind of work. Uh, but really, we, what we really calculate analytically is this. And the point is that this B dot del dot pi turns out to be proportional to the kind of magnetic pumpingness, B dot grad log B, squared flux surface average, that's what those bars mean, or carrots mean, times a poloidal flow velocity, which comes from take, uh, having a divergence-free flow, and then uh, this poloidal flow is the flow in the poloidal direction divided by the magnetic field in the poloidal direction, uh, and it turns out to be a flux function, uh, which means it's constant on a flux surface. That's great. Okay. Now we need a little bit more geometry here. So again, we write the magnetic field as this covariant, contra, covariant, 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 contravariant basis, um, so forth. And the flux surface average has the, if we average over a flux surface, we average over the poloidal angle and over the toroidal angle. We have symmetry in the toroidal direction, so we'll later expand in toroidal harmonics or 
you know, Fourier series in that direction, but anyway. And the flux surface average has the uh, nice feature that it annihilates parallel derivatives. So if we take parallel derivative b dot grad of a scalar function, its flux, flux surface average vanishes. And so that helps us. Why does that help us? Well, let's look at our Ohm's law here, which is what I'm going to want to deal with. So if I deal with this equation, my electric field, I can take the parallel projection of this. Uh, so V dot E is something that I'm going to calculate. But hey, look at this. B dot will cause that to vanish. I'll still have the friction. B dot that will vanish. B dot del isotropic pressure, that will vanish when I flux surface average. So all I'm going to get is friction, A to J, and viscosity along the field line. So what does this B dot del dot pi really look like? Now you have to go into those moment, uh, expand the distribution function in a lowest order Maxwellian and the flow distortions and the flow, flow, heat flow, energy weighted heat flow, et cetera. But I'm only going to show you the two by two matrix version. So this is the parallel viscous force and the parallel heat stress force. And it will be a matrix of viscosity coefficients, which are given by these quantities, which are given by these quantities. And the basic idea is depending upon exactly how low the collision frequency is, you have various answers. So what happens physically, as Professor Rox actually talked about, is you get so-called banana orbits, or, and Javier talked a little bit about. Namely, a particle is, is, is going along a field line, but if it's going up a magnetic field, if it didn't have enough parallel velocity to start with, it's going to reflect back. As it does this toroidal motion like this, it's actually drifting a little off the surface. And so in a memorable meeting in 1968 in Novosibirsk, a, a, a US uh, a scientist a professor at UCLA, Bert Fried, uh, observed uh, Galeev and Sagdeev of the Soviet Union showing these pictures like this. And so he said, hey, that looks like a banana. And for better or worse, <laughs> uh, we have called them bananas ever since, okay? On the other hand, if I didn't, if I wasn't quite collisionless enough, I might only make it uh, uh, halfway through the banana and I get collisions. And that's called the plateau regime. And then I can have a short main free path, short collision length regime, whereas Braginsky. And so you go through these, all these manipulations, and that's a lot of kinetic analysis to get those. But anyway, the moral to this story is these coefficients vary as a function of collisionality. In, in um, uh, like Eater uh, planned experiments, hoped for, they, they'll be mostly in the so-called banana regime. So what happens? Well, our, if we go to our total momentum balance equation here, okay, for our fluid, and we say, well, I'd kind of like to know d by dt, and I'll assume we have small flow velocities, and I'll take the parallel derivative of this, that's zero, I'll annihilate that. So lo and behold, my parallel momentum equation, our flow equation, flux surface averaged, is just, is just the uh, b dot del dot pi averaged this uh, poloidal viscous force. And so what happens is you write that out and it's uh, a combination of the poloidal flow and a poloidal heat flow. And then you kind of work this out and you can show that the poloidal flow should be a temperature gradient diamagnetic type flow. And there's a magic coefficient of 1.17 derived in a paper by Rosenbluth, Hazeltine, and Hinton in 1970, one or two. And uh, it actually depends upon collisionality and gets kind of complicated, but we won't worry about that. And then I'll come back later to this actually helps us. We already had force balance on an earlier, faster time scale, compressional off wave wave time scale. And then this uh, process specifies that poloidal flow, which is a, a diamagnetic poloidal flow. And so you get a relationship between the toroidal rotation speed uh, 
flow velocity and the radioelectric field. Okay, now, uh, so we can include these low collisionality um, effects in this MHD model by doing some fancy footwork, I guess I would say, with respect to the parallel um, uh, stress uh, function, P perp. This is actually just P perp minus P parallel. And it has a two parts to it. One is kind of a fast part, which is the Braginsky. This is effectively the, the fast Braginsky parts. And it has a residual, which is in this form. And this form is the kind that Boniface would like, <laughs> although I don't think he uses this one. There's another one we came up with some time ago. Anyway, and then you get that this is poloidal damping frequency. See, this is just going to turn out to be a damping, uh, which has all these regimes, and you have an offset uh, velocity. Now, so basically what it amounts to is you take a chunk of fluid here, and you... You, you, you take a chunk of fluid and it moves from the outside to the inside and it wants to be incompressible but there's a little bit of collisions that damp it and uh, so forth. And so you damp the poloidal flow to this offset poloidal flow, uh, diamagnetic poloidal flow, on about the ionine collision time scale, which again for eater numbers, 30 milliseconds. Now you also affect the, um, the resistivity. Because if we look at our Ohm's law here, and again we take the, the B dot E, we're going to have B dot E, here's electric field, the R was the uh, friction, so this was current over Spitzer. Whoops, but this thing, uh, this viscous dissipation here, is going to be on the same scale. So basically what it amounts to is that instead of having Spitzer resistivity, because I'm moving along a uniform magnetic field, I'm moving along a field line that's, you know, going from the outside where B, B is small to the inside, and so it's trying to compress. There's a little bit of viscous dissipation on the collision time scale that handles that. So I'm going to take you through four versions of getting the, radio, <laughs> the plasma resistivity. So basically, if, if you assume, hey, I'm collisional, I'm Braginsky, or I'm not even Braginsky, I'm just going to take a flow shifted Maxwellian, you find that the resistivity is just m nu m times the collision frequency over n sub e e squared. You then go to the next level and you say, well, let's see. And uh, Vladimir was, Tukhanovich, was mentioning this. Remember, the energetic electrons tend to carry more of this flow or more of the response to the electric field. So, okay, so then I'll go into my fluid moment stuff. Remember, we did the multiple moment stuff. And we'll get a, an equation for zero is electric field friction. And uh, we'll get a friction matrix on the flow, and we'll invert that. And then we'll get our friction force will be a, a current and so forth. And on the next slide, uh, we inverted that matrix, that N matrix in this case. And this, this is what gives us the current uh, uh, flow in response to an electric field with an electrical conductivity sigma spitzer. And sigma spitzer is here with the two by two matrix. You get this, and lo and behold, that two by two matrix is accurate to about 2%. Three by three that we did earlier is accurate to less than 1%, fantastic, uh, compared to our one over log lambda 6% accuracy. So we're happy with that. But again, along the field, we have this effect of the parallel flow having to be, uh, heat flow having to be taken into account. Perpendicular, I apply a force perpendicular to the field line in a magnetized plasma, and the plasma flows that way. So there's no heat flow that goes along with it. So you just get the raw uh, resistivity. Now let's add, okay, so here's our parallel electric field, here's our friction force, and now let's add viscosity. And again, B dot de grad phi for a potential and B dot gra grad pressure for a potential both vanish and B dot grad pre temperature vanish, flux surface average. Flux surface average of a parallel derivative um, uh, vanishes. So in matrix form, now our B dot del dot pi and theta, again, is damping of poloidal flows and poloidal heat flows, which we can write as currents and pressure gradients. Aha. 
There's where we're going to get our bootstrap current, by the way, and a poloidal flow, and so forth. So then we go back up here and we say, okay, let's form ourselves a two, a two by two matrix equation. So here's our electric field goes over here. Uh, this is our uh, uh, friction plus viscosity operating on B, uh, the parallel current and the um, uh, parallel heat flow plus the viscous, viscous damping uh, rate uh, matrix of coefficients, this stuff. Uh, and all and operating on these quantities. And this equation you solve for the parallel current by inverting the, this matrix here. You solve this by you know, sticking this on the right hand side and just take it. And I can do two by two matrices, by the way, by hand. <laughs> Don't even need a computer. Okay, so what do you get? You get that the, that the electric field, now again, along the field line flux surface average, is the parallel neoclassical resistivity, which is here, um, and uh, on the current, so this is my E equals A to J. But now I've got a bootstrap current. And what's the bootstrap current? Uh, well, again, the neoclassical resistivity is now uh, one over the matrix inverted, the zero, zero component. This is roughly speaking the old resistivity plus a one plus the viscous coefficient over nu, and that's of order unity. Anyway, the bootstrap current is inverse on the pressure gradient. Why is it called a bootstrap current? Well, we worked real hard. We made an inductive flux change through the center of the core here, caused an electric field, inductive electric field around this direction, the tokamak, and we're working, using up that flux change to get a big current here. Now we've got a situation where pressure's high in the center and on the outside it's down. So the pressure gradient's in, and you work out the directions, and lo and behold, the pressure gradient goes in the same direction as you'd like. Uh, it causes an additional current in the same direction as you started with. So hey, it's a bootstrap going in the right direction. And people have actually done experiments where they have created 80 to 90% of the total current being caused by this bootstrap current. It's a little uncontrollable when it gets up to about 100% because you don't have any seed current upon which it builds. But, <laughs> but they, they have ways of doing that experimentally. And experimentally, I might say, the math here, which I've made somewhat simpler, comes out to within 10% of the right uh, amount of current. That is to say, the accuracy with which this theory gives you the Bootstrap current is to within 10, 20%, which is about as good as you can do on the analysis. So it's a real thing, bootstrap current, okay? So basically, the um, extended MHD model then is a plasma density and charge continuity equations from, you know, all these things, and divergence J equals zero, a momentum equation, which, uh, uh, has these parallel viscous stresses and uh, right there, electrons and ions, uh, well, a fast part and a slow part, and the cross or gyroviscous part, and an electric field which is quite complicated, but we're going to need all of it, okay, in a code. Faraday's law gives us that how we determine a magnetic field in a tokamak, and we'll come back to this, is minus the curl of E. And that E is the one we've got to use, okay? So anyway, and you can work out the parallel currents and the drives, the parallel currents are, are, are I'm sorry, the drives. There's going to be some more uh, drives here. Uh, drives, uh, sources of current, sources of parallel current. So the key properties of this model are that it primarily adds viscous parallel viscous forces, parallel viscous stresses. And for time scales longer than the electron collision time, which in this set of numbers for reader is about 0.2 milliseconds, um, and it increases the resistivity a little bit of the plasma. And then on a longer time scale, it, uh, about 30 milliseconds, it uh, damps the poloidal flow. And then, um, but this is a point that I want to emphasize to my kinetic colleagues, gyrokinetics, drift kinetics, et cetera, et cetera. 
and myself, I should say, but that's a different matter. Um, and that is that in these ideal MHD, uh, extended MHD models, as my colleague at uh, Wisconsin puts it, this is Chris Hegna, he says, we in MHD own J. What he means by that <laughs> is that in the magnetic, in the extended MHD calculations, you use that the magnetic field evolves according to an electric field, and you have here an, a, a, an extended Ohm's law. And then you calculate the J from the curl of that magnetic field. And so initial value codes, as they're called, Nimrod, M3DC1, Jorick, et cetera, what they do is they evolve these equations, and they own B and J. So kinetic people, however, usually say, oh, well, we'll calculate J parallel, and we'll calculate the density and make quasi-neutrality by N equals Ni, and divergence J equals zero. We'll calculate J parallel and J perp and make them all, all work to give divergence J equals zero. But to calculate J, MHD says, no, no, you don't understand. We own J, you know. <laughs> so it's a very different philosophy. We've got to get this together over some period of time is my basic comment. Um, the way you find this in particular, where Chris Hegna came up with this expression in a meeting workshop, was we were talking together with some people who work on ICRF or wave introduction into a plasma. And they would say, we've calculated the amount of current perturbation caused by this RF that we put in. There's an absorption of momentum. And Chris said, no, no, you don't understand. We own J. Because they were trying to put that effect in this uh, tokamak description. We own J. You can't give us that. What should they give? They should give a source of momentum and calculate the response to that source of momentum. And so at least we've convinced the RF community that they have to give that source of momentum, and then we'll calculate the rest of it. Anyway, but that's a, uh, and the way I would suggest we can do that to make our kinetic and, and MHE-like prescriptions work is to use a Chapman-Anskog-like kinetic equation because it has no momentum uh, contribution, hence no current. And then, whoops, sorry. So the, whoops, I see, I went backwards. So anyway, and then, so now, okay, I'm going to stop here for just a minute and ask some questions because I'm going to start on to kind of a new subject. So I've gotten us through the ideal MHD, don't let us have any of those big instabilities, resistive neoclassical MHD, don't let me have any reconnections on some time scale, and calculate the, the appropriate Ohm's law and the appropriate uh, poloidal flow damping, and now I want to get out to the Transport equations, multi-second, six seconds, okay? And so I'm going to switch to the transport equation. But I thought I ought to stop here and just ask briefly if people want to make a couple of comments or questions on, on this uh, extended MHD framework and discussion. If you want to put questions, <laughs> we will be recording them. Uh-oh. <laughs> <laughs> so just Again, I would love to see a good, let me say, mathematical proof of this. The philosophy we use is a multiple time scale uh, philosophy. That is to say, the Gratschafranov equation is on time scales short compared to the um, resistive uh, type effects that you mentioned, uh, eta, eta del squared, uh, magnetic diffusivity del squared b. And, um, 
actually there was some, effectively the old Fierce Schluter paper was effectively on this subject. And you can prove under certain circumstances that they are sufficiently separate in time scale that you can have this in quasi-equilibrium, the Gradge Franoff, and then the evolution. I don't think this is terribly satisfactory to mathematicians, satisfactory to the physicists. <laughs> V cross B. Oh, this one, yeah. Oh, this one. Ah, this one is actually a diamagnetic type flow, and so it's an omega star. Again, that's a slower process, like resistivity. I I didn't go through why, but yeah, it was the diamagnetic two fluid effect that Javier was talking about. Just commented on your uh, yeah. two orbs or what? <laughs> so, uh, in, uh, could we say that uh, MHD equation describing global motion in Kakamak and what kinetic pretends to do with just local quantities which you are putting in your global equations? On ideal MHD, yes. On the resistive time scales, longer than collision times and reconnections, the, I need to take a flux surface average. But still, you consider them at the, at the sources. <sighs> the, the, <laughs> <laughs> the people who do codes say, I must have it local. <laughs> the people like me who do analytics to try to figure out what's going on, it's sure a lot easier to take a flux surface average. <laughs> I've had a graduate student who's worked on b dot del dot pi, not averaging. It has certain difficulties, let's just say. With <laughs> his director. <laughs> no, it has singularities in a collisionless banana regime, but you have to do boundary layer analysis to keep it from blowing up for particles that go just barely over the magnetic hills. <laughs> and we didn't do the boundary layer analysis. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Okay. So we'll go on to. Okay. Now, uh, Vladimir and I were talking earlier. In the tokamak area, um, tokamak means is a Russian word, of course, meaning, and the Russians uh, uh, developed it. Uh, Lev Artsimovich and uh, Yankov, or something before then. Zakharov. Oh well, Zakharov was, and uh, Tom, but Zakharov, yeah certainly proposed it, but I mean on the experimental side. Um, and uh, Artsimovich puts it a lot. And in a sense, they got out ahead of the, exper of the theorists, okay? As a result, um, they did not start by saying, the theory says this and we'll build it to do this. They said, we think it's gonna kind of work this way and they built it and made it work. And then they told the theorists, How's it, ask the theorists, how's it working? <laughs> and so, as a result, a lot of what's happened over the years in tokamak plasma physics along the theoretical line has been paying catch up to the experimental side. So, when you say, oh, well, let's, let's do an analysis of I put some heat in the center, how fast will it get out? Well, we'll use Braginsky equations and we'll just adapt them and do whatever we want to. And then people come along and they say, well, uh, which is, um, so there were these transport codes developed to do that and they only calculated density and uh, temperature uh, fluent moment equations with the collisional Braginsky equations. And as I mentioned last time, they said, look, parallel transport along field lines is fantastic, so we'll just assume it's kind of constant along field lines, won't worry about it. And so then people got a little smarter and they said, well, these things I was talking about about the viscosity. Well, okay, we got an Ohm's law with trapped particle effects and this bumpiness and so forth, and we'll just kind of stick them in, okay? And then fluctuation-induced transport. Well, it's across the field, so I'll just add it. You know, it's anomalous transport. And then they came along and they said, well, I'll introduce heating and current drive. And these codes, and, and I'm gonna tell you about next time, a good bit about small 3D magnetic field asymmetries. 
I said it's axisymmetric. Real machines aren't, and, and they use them for control. But anyway, so it, it, was, it has been getting into a huge hodgepodge. And as a theorist, I work a lot with experimentalists. I go into these codes, 1, 2, Transman, Jetto, and, X, and uh, I can't remember all the rest of them in various parts of the world. Well, uh, Astra, and it's good code, and so forth. You look into them, and as a theorist, you have to do this and say, well, OK, if you want to use that, we can kind of, <laughs> you know. But it, you, you have this feeling it's not um, consistent. So, and because tokamaks are in a collisional regime, we should really develop transport in a systematic way. And so over the last five years with some colleagues, I've been working on trying to develop a systematic procedure that will be able to handle all of these things consistently. And this is going to get a little ugly, so I'll just highlight some features of it. So basically, again, we always start, from my view, in the plasma kinetic equation. And we take the uh, density, momentum, and energy moments of it. And we try to determine these uh, closure moments and, and the uh, friction moments and so forth. Uh, we try to do some kinetic theory, and I would certainly prefer that be done in the Chapman-Enskog way so that it's consistent with the uh, fluid moment equations we're going to get. And uh, I'll need parallel viscous forces in, flu in flux surface averages. This is where I really need the flux surface averages. <laughs> but uh, anyway, so you put all that together, um, and uh, that, that's the schema. One thing I want to emphasize is here, notice DNDT is evaluated at a certain spatial position. So that means it's evaluated right there. But really, what we kind of have as a philosophy is that radially we came to an equilibrium. We have these flux surfaces. And really, temperature and density are more or less constant on those flux surfaces. And what we care about is transport relative to those flux surfaces. So I'm going to have to transfer uh, to trans, uh, uh, transfer. I'm going to have to uh, change coordinates from being a constant at a given spatial position to asking about what's these, what are these equations like relative to a flux surface. Okay, that'll come a little later. So we have to make a number of assumptions. Oh, you have oh, it's plasma physics. You make a lot of assumptions. Anyway. Small gyro radius approximation. Well, as I mentioned, we're one part in 10 to the 3. We're terrific. Uh, axisymmetric flux surfaces to lowest order. No magnetic islands of interest, or, or they're very thin, or we won't worry about them. Um, gyro radius, small magnetic perturbations. Uh, I'll tell you next time about a whole bunch of things having to do with uh, magnetic perturbations that are not axisymmetric. But they're only one part in 10 to the 3, one part in 10 to the 4. So they're mostly not a big deal. Fairly low collision lengths, so that, you know, field lines are, uh, I'm sorry, the collision lengths are many times around the torus. And also, in the same spirit as uh, drift kinetics and gyrokinetics, we're going to assume that the fluctuations are gyro radius small. That is to say, E phi tilde fluctuation over T is a small number, again, 10 to the minus 2, 10 to the minus 3. And finally, uh, we may put in extra current and change the poloidal field structure, but we'll do that on a slow transport time scale. Now, so basically what we're going to do is average the density, momentum, and energy equations over the fluctuations. Um, we're going to expand in a toroidal mode number because they've got axisymmetry in that direction, not in the poloidal direction, not radially. And we'll take a flux surface average. Then we're going to split, and this is going to be the key part, is we're going to look at this momentum equation, momentum equations, on various uh, directions. We, also, we already know from Braginsky in a collisional magnetized plasma, along field lines is fantastically fast, microseconds or less, in a tokamak. 
you, you were even shorter than that, but <laughs> Vladimir, <laughs> much shorter than, <laughs> than by microseconds. Uh, and then poloidal flows or poloidal damping is, yeah, you know, sort of milliseconds. And then uh, radial transport is going to be much longer. But we're going to split it into the radial force balance gives us ideal MHD equilibrium. And that gives us a, a, a radial force balance in the ions. And then we're, we're, we're going to, OK. Here we're not going to, I'm sorry, we're not going to do so much in time scale as directions. So we're going to consider radial force balance. Uh, I'm sorry, we've got a momentum equation. We've got to get three components of it. We're going to use radial. We're going to use parallel. And we're going to use toroidal. You, you, you can say, wait, wait, wait a minute. Kind of parallels kind of like toroidal. But it's not, OK? Parallel is with the twist, and toroidal is just you know, this way, OK? Uh, what about at an x point? Remember we had this little x point down here? Well, of course, an x point's a vulnerable place. Small perturbations will, you know. On those field lines, they actually go around, you know. And what's the theoretician's answer? Don't go there. <laughs> that is to say. Uh, we, we will be doing an analysis that's only on closed flux surfaces inside the, uh, the uh, separatrix, okay? Okay, so that's our going to be, and then what we're going to do is we're going to get the net uh, ambipolar and non-ambipolar flux surfaces and put those into getting comprehensive equations, not Braginsky, but br equations that are transformed from being evaluated as a given spatial position to being on at constant flux surface. The radial coordinate will be the flux surface. Okay. Now, turns out you need a good coordinate system. Um, if the tokamak was a nice long cylinder, you could have, you know, a cylindrical coordinate system and everybody would be happy. In a tokamak, the field lines are twisted, and they're twisted in a torus you end up with a non-orthogonal coordinate system, okay? Well, face up to it, okay? So the idea is that um, you have co uh, contravariant base vectors uh, and covariant base vectors, and, you know, you, you have all this stuff. But anyway, and you, you, you're very interested in components along the magnetic field along the magnetic field and cross uh, in the perpendicular direction. And again, flux surface average of a scalar quantity vanishes. Flux surface average of a vector quantity turns out to be a, like a cylindrical operator, 1 over rho, d by d rho of rho times the radial component, flux surface average. Um, so then what you say for this analysis is you say, well, I'm going to have, the, say, my pressure as an equilibrium structure, a function of, of radius. Rho here is toroidal flux function. I'll come back to that. And then we're going to have an average, which is typically called the fierce schluter part. Turns out the, the, the pressure is not absolutely constant on a flux surface. It has a, a, a rho star, a one, um, one part in 10 to the 3 variation within a flux surface. So I'll have to allow for that poloidal variation. And then I'm going to have uh, fluctuations, microturbulence, et cetera, where it'd be P1 tilde, which is three-dimensional. Uh, these are non-axis symmetries if I apply an extra 3D field or fluctuations, and then higher order stuff. And of course, if I toroidally average any fluctuating quantity which is expanded in a Fourier series, it will vanish, but the quadratics will not and so forth. And we will allow that maybe these uh, perturbations, these fluctuations, are very fine scale. So that when you take, and this is effectively what you do in gyrokinetics, et cetera, if you take the radial derivative of a perturbation, it'll be 1 over that fluctuation gradient scale length times, oh, it was small to begin with, but that'll make it an order unity question, a qu quantity, not a small one, and so forth and so on. And then we'll say the magnetic field is this axisymmetric Gradjevranov solution to lowest order 
plus magnetic perturbations and so forth. And the electric field, we have the E sub A is the inductive electric field produced by uh, flux change in the core transformer causes an electric field around the torus, dA dt or d psi dt. But you can have the poloidal flux surfaces moving or the toroidal flux surfaces moving in time. And we'll have to come back to that. So then you just do that, okay? Uh, and now we have, I'm, I'm still using the same equations. Uh, so I got to my density equation here and I just uh, do this average business. And I say, oh, that's kind of interesting. So I'll just get a density as dn dt at a given spatial position is one over, this is a v prime is the derivative of the volume with respect to the um, minor radius coordinate, which you can think of as just like a cylindrical radius. One over at rho, d by d rho of rho, gamma is the particle flux. So it's an n v2, which is going to be our um, collisional classical, et cetera, neoclassical transport. And then the fluctuation driven transport. And you could have third order n tilde v tilde blah 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 but that would be higher order and we're only going to second order and you do the energy equation you get a similar sort of thing but then the momentum equation gets tricky it's a vector equation and again we want to take our components in various directions so the radial component will look like this oh gee this looks like I sum it over species. This is my ideal MHD equation. So this is going to give me radial force balance uh, of the entire species, or entire plasma, hence grad Shafranoff equation. And this other part, when I am in equilibrium, will give me ion force balance equation. Um, anyway, the parallel part's what we've been dealing with. That's what we were talking about, poloidal flow damping, viscous effects on uh, the resistivity. And finally, we're going to get to a toroidal momentum equation. And this one's kind of interesting. This is for a species. And uh, we got a Q gamma there. That would represent Q is the charge. Gamma is the particle flux. Well, we're going to come back to this later. I'd better arrange that the sum of those over species is zero so that I get no net current, okay, across fields. That will be important to us. Okay, but now I want to go through these a little bit. So the compressional Alfane waves on the Alfane time scale microsecond cause us to enforce J cross B equals grad P. And then you look at Ohm's law, neglecting the perpendicular components of the viscosity. And you see that the toroidal rotation, flow dot grad zeta, grad zeta is my toroidal direction, is given by the radial electric field, phi is my potential, um, pressure, and a poloidal flow. And for experimentalists, I always write down this as the toroidal flow is an E cross B flow, a pressure gradient, and a um, poloidal flow. These are both diamagnetic type effects. I might say as a matter of information, in gyrokinetics uh, and drift kinetics, people say, hey, look, I'll have kind of like an MHD-like framework where the E cross B flow, which is what this represents, uh, processional flow, but anyway, um, is much greater than these diamagnetic flow effects. And so the, most, the ways most of the gyrokinetics and uh, drift kinetics work is they don't take account of these. Pragmatically, in present tokamaks, as I'll discuss next time, um, all three terms are very comparable. And so we, we really need to be doing it this way, I would suggest. Anyway, then on time scale, so this is, this is the roast zero. But then, that is to say, on the fast compressional alphane wave and so forth. But then when we get out longer than the collision time, then our response is to give us a, a, a Maxwellian distribution function. And then you can say that, well, the, the flows perturbed or equilibrium, either one, are given by poloidal flows written in a covariant contravariant base vector way here, uh, or they're parallel and cross. So you can say they're toroidal and poloidal, or you can say they're parallel 
and, um, and a cross, and, or and toroidal. But anyway, so then, your di then what you have in the cross direction are your flows, which are the E cross B flow and the diamagnetic flow, it turns out. And that's effectively what we use to get the, uh, visco uh, the vi poloidal viscous damping of ion flows and the uh, viscous correction to the resistivity and get us bootstrap current and so forth. But we will use a philosophy here that sort of comes from what we did a long time ago in stellarators, uh, people did, which is uh, since the flows, remember the flows kind of came in at about, uh, uh, at about the first order in gyro radius, and they sort of came in uh, you know, with about the collisional time scale, not the transport time scale. So we treat the, the flows first, and then we calculate the perpendicular. Okay, so for, again, in calculating those flows, what we get is, again, our, our um, uh, electron Ohm's law is just right here, and we take B dot del, or B dot, the parallel component of this, and uh, then we take the flux surface average, and we get an equation like that. And if we take account of fluctuations in addition to collisional effects, then we see that the, the uh, electric field is the parallel current minus the bootstrap current, minus one over conductivity, but anyway, the bootstrap current, the current drive, and the dynamo. And so the idea is the bootstrap current is this, that's what we got before, but if we have uh, non-inductive current drive, we inject some momentum source from electron waves, electron current drive from electron cyclotron heating, or we get fluctuations, Reynolds stress, Maxwell stress. Now, to the best of experimental abilities to measure things, so far, the only thing that counts is bootstrap. These current drives, they actually do sometimes, and that works out pretty good. And the fluctuations don't seem to contribute. And so, uh, but that, there you just have to go to the experimental uh, stuff to say. But it works out, sort of. Um, now, we can add together the currents, and so uh, we got that the current is a parallel component plus the cross within the flux surface. Because not, we're not going to allow any current radially because it just build up and the plasma would build up too big a current. So anyway, you can go through the math and find out that the currents are like this. And so the parallel current turns out to be the flux surface average parallel current plus a Fierce-Schluter part, as it's called, which is the slight variation within a flux surface. And this is calculated, uh, the parallel current flux surface average is <laughs> kind of ugly, flux surface average of grad row squared, uh, geometric factors, but roughly speaking, it's a cylindrical operator. And so, you, you know, that's sort of okay. Okay, now let's go back and talk about that poloidal flow. Remember, we used effectively the momentum equation here, and we, we took the equilibrium, or time dependence, uh, I guess I've got up there, and we took the parallel component, so that vanishes, and the B dot del pressure vanishes. But hey, all these things are fluctuating. Mm. So the net result is we get a bunch of terms, okay? And so you go through the math, and now you find that the poloidal flow is not just the neoclassical offset, which we had before, but it has a bunch of parallel Reynolds stress terms and parallel Maxwell stress terms. Reynolds stress is just like a Reynolds stress in a, in a uh, hydrodynamic fluid, except here it's, you know, just in a plasma fluid, basically. But it's the parallel component of a Reynolds stress, parallel to the magnetic field, and that tends to vanish. So on a theoretical basis, you say, hey, this is kind of small, and it turns out the magnetic perturbation is even smaller, so it seems like it's very small. However, I go to my experimental colleagues who, you gotta realize, by the way, if you're a theorist, applied mathematician theorist, experimentalists, as I, as, well, the joke in the United States is, the way they get the notches in the gun for killing people is how many theories they blow away by showing that they're wrong, okay? <laughs> and so experimentalists go and they try to measure the poloidal flow and say, does it turn out to be this neoclassical? And the answer is, grudgingly, under some circumstances, yes, it works. 
However, there's a debate in the community going on, but it's not always the case. Part of it has to do with we as theorists pick on the experimentalists and say, are you sure your measurements are accurate enough, and et cetera, et cetera. And so there's a very vigorous dialogue. But pragmatically, they seem to have some cases where maybe there's some parallel rental stress things or something like it that we don't understand um, that is uh, causing or maybe sources that we don't understand that are in the plasma. And so this part, so we get through the ideal MHD all seems to work. Electron collision time, Ohm's law seems to work, but we get out on this ionine collision time scale, 34 milliseconds in eater it would be, and we're getting where hmm, <laughs> uh, we may be running into trouble and we may, uh, we may not have that right. But anyway, we've been working out formulas and we can say, okay, go, out, go evaluate these things. And uh, people are trying. Okay, now again, I didn't write it up here, but you remember these equations are all at a constant spatial position. So what we should do is uh, we need to um, uh, realize that the poloidal flux and the toroidal flux are actually evolving. Namely, you know, I throw in neutral beams actually create a little bit of a current. So I turn on the neutral beams and stick them in there. Now the current profile is changing and I have to calculate how that changes the poloidal magnetic field and the toroidal magnetic field. Well, if you think about it, so I've got a tokamak here and the toroidal field coils are big and they're producing five tesla magnetic field. You're not going to change the toroidal field very much, okay? But how do you get, how do you produce the poloidal magnetic field, the twist? That's by the current. But if I diddle the current a little bit or add a little bootstrap current or something or other, I can maneuver the poloidal field. So two things as a consequence of that. One is, what coordinate system do you want to choose? Well, I'd like to choose the one that's most fixed, okay? So what happens is all these transport codes that have been developed, they say, I will use the toroidal flux as my basis for my coordinate system. So I put down here in the small print that the rho, the radius, is approximately the uh, toroidal flux. So I didn't actually write that right, I see, but anyway. Um, what you do is you just divide the toroidal flux by pi times b toroidal on the axis. But anyway, it's based on, uh, on the, uh, it, it, the radial coordinates based on the toroidal magnetic flux because that doesn't move very much. But when I go jiggling the current profile around um, by uh, doing my uh, bootstrap current or a current drive or a dynamo current, then my poloidal field will diffusively relax with another operator, it turns out, um, uh, on the poloidal flux minus the various sources here. And so, you know, this is just a diffuse, simple diffusion, source-driven uh, diffusion equation. And to the extent that I vary any of these things, it uh, comes in. So I have to transform my... It's a, it, it's, it's, it's a funny business. I have to transform my, all my uh, equations here from partial with respect to t at a constant spatial position to partial with respect to t at a constant poloidal flux. But I will use toroidal flux as my coordinate system. So it's a little tricky, but anyway. And I'll have to allow for poloidal flux moving relative to toroidal flux. So, um, and so I was just mentioning here that the, it turns out the grad shafranov equation is determined in terms of the poloidal flux, the classical and neoclassical transport, collisional and neoclassical due to the bumps, uh, are determined across poloidal magnetic flux surfaces, and all of our drift kinetic, gyrokinetic equations are based on Maxwellians that are constant on a poloidal magnetic flux to lowest order, and the canonical toroidal angular momentum depends upon the vector potential in the toroidal direction, which itself is a poloidal magnetic flux. So we need to do this transform uh, from the fluid moment equations from being on laboratory position to being on poloidal. 
And uh, I worked through a part of this, and it's called a, an analysis called paleoclassical transport. It gets me in trouble with some theorists, but it works pretty well experimentally. But anyway, and the idea is that actually as the poloidal flux surfaces, if you look at a single particle, a single poloidal flux position, it, at, at canonical triangular angular momentum says it moves with the poloidal, that the particle moves with a poloidal flux as it diffuses away and you get additional diffusion. But the better, the bigger thing is you end up changing your uh, equations df dt at constant spatial position uh, to get it to constant poloidal flux. You introduce a collision operator and now a spatial uh, diffusion operator, but that's not terribly important here. The net result is, uh, so your, densi your density equation becomes d by dt on a flux surface of v prime rho is equal to poloidal motion. If you jam in the current, you diff change the poloidal field structure, so you move it. Here's some transport and some sources. The transport flux, the particle flux, has the usual collisional stuff, has the usual, the usual fluctuation stuff, and it has this, what I call, paleoclassical. But again, notice, <laughs> Well, our coordinate system is really the poloidal, uh, as toroidal flux determined, um, even though um, uh, it's the poloidal flux everything's measured relative to. Now, how do we go at the radial fluxes? So we've been dealing with, again, radial force balance, poloidal variations and currents and stuff in the, within the flux surfaces. How do we go across flux surfaces? And um, so what you end up doing is you're, you're going to take a uh, momentum equation for one fluid. And if you take the radial component of this, this is the, it turns out scaling wise because of the small gyro radius, this is the biggest term we've got. If you take the radial grad saw, uh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, we, we want to take the toroidal component of this equation. So if we take the toroidal component of V cross B, which is the biggest scaling number here, the toroidal component turns out to be, you just do a little vector analysis for our given poloidal or magnetic field coordinate system. That component is actually the flow relative to across the flux surfaces, flow dot grad P, uh, psi poloidal. So what that tells you is I, if I write this whole equation as the toroidal component of this equals all kinds of other toroidal forces, it says that any toroidal force will cause a flow across flux surfaces. So therefore, my particle fluxes across flux surfaces are the sum of all toroidal Actually, it's a, a covariant base vector of the forces, so they're the torques. So every plasma process that creates a toroidal torque in a plasma, that force cross B, is B poloidal, is a radial flux in the plasma. And so you can just go through and do this analysis, and that's in the papers that I've been telling you about. And then you have to transform it, again, from laboratory coordinates to, to um, poloidal flux coordinates. And uh, here's the wonderful thing. Um, this is the intimidation slide. Uh, it turns out there are eight ambipolar flux surfaces due to various torques or forces, okay? So, uh, by the way, what do I mean by ambipolar? Ambipolar means the electrons and ions go together, so they will not create a current. Non-ambipolar will be on the next slide. There's eight of them, too. Uh, Non-ambipolar means the electrons and ions are going across flux surfaces at different rates. So, hey, they're going to create a current, and I'm going to have to set the sum of that entire set of currents to zero. So what kind of fluxes do I get? Well, collisions okay, within the flux surface, B cross grad rho means, you know, this direction. Frictional forces on that, that'll give me what's called classical diffusion, which is collision frequency times, elect it says collision frequency times electron gyro radii, very, very small, 
uh, classical diffusion. Then you have an effect which is basically collisions, resistivity of uh, poloidal flows within the surface or currents, and, and that's your Schluter diffusion. Then you have a viscous part, which is due to this vis parallel viscous force that we talked about. Um, that's called banana plateau. Then you have this particles go with the fields. That's called paleoclassical. Then you have fluctuation-induced density transport, which is automatically ambipolar because if you just take this and say, okay, now I'll multiply by Q the charge, lo and behold, this will vanish and that will vanish. So that's automatically ambipolar. And then uh, you have current drive and dynamos, which uh, can come in. And you have uh, so-called pinch effects. Uh, anyway. And then you can go to your non-ambipolar fluxes. And here, uh, well, I multiply by psi prime, which is dp d psi, b poloidal a. Here you can have regular, well, what we're going to talk about next time, so-called neoclassical toroidal viscosity, which is just toroidal damping because you remember we were talking about bumpy cylinders. Well, it turns out a tokamak is not totally axisymmetric, but it has some toroidal ripples. And that will give us so-called neoclassical toroidal viscosity, which will um, be f uh, uh, dissipation rate mu uh, non-axisymmetric perturbations times the flow minus an offset. We'll talk about that next time. Anyway, then you can have perpendicular viscosities. You can have uh, ion polarization flows. You can have Reynolds stresses. You can have Maxwell stresses. This is where, to my way of thinking, all of the things that come from gyrokinetics and drift kinetics need to fit into this realm, it turns out. You can get resonant uh, on rational surfaces. You can get little currents. They reconnect field lines there. And uh, this gives you what's called a field, field, uh, field error-induced resistive layer. You can get these poloidal flux transients, and you can you inject neutral beams, and they're actually a momentum source in the plasma. So then you say, well, look, I need to make, I had all these eight non-ambipolar particle fluxes, and I need to have their sum vanish. I cannot have a radio current on, it, it, you can figure out the time scale, but it would be microsupings that would try to build up, and you can't allow that. So you say the plasma will have a, no net radio current from the sum of all these. And um, so you can say, well, again, radio currents, the ambipolar ones, but they all uh, are ambipolar, so they don't contribute to the total radio current. And then you can work out, turns out, the time rate of change of the uh, current equation. And lo and behold, you better set J dot grad psi equals zero, flux surface average. And what you get is what amounts to from no radio currents, you get the toroidal momentum balance, toroidal angular momentum balance. LT is mass density times the toroidal angular frequency, R squared angular um, moment. So you get an inertia term, you get an NTV from 3D perturbations, you get perpendicular viscosities, you get Reynolds stresses, you get field error stuff, you get poloidal motion, so forth. And so this is just a repeat of that. And uh, uh, anyway, and the uh, Reynolds stress, okay, in, when you deal in hydrodynamics, more or less the Reynolds stress is just an isotropic, more or less, type of um, viscous stress. Actually, in tokamaks, it's not. And so it has a diffusion part. It has a pinch meaning it's not diffusive, but it's a flow velocity of the uh, pinch flow velocity, pinch because it's usually inward, um, and times the toroidal angular momentum, and a residual stress, which comes about because the fluctuations are not uh, symmetry preserving. But anyway, that's a kind of a detail. And people hope, believe it or not, that that term is going to be important in ITER because it's how you're going to get a, <laughs> a toroidal uh, flow. Uh, I'll talk more about toroidal flow next time, but anyway. Now, earlier we had already established that the toroidal rotation frequency is a, um, uh, related to the electric field and a couple of diamagnetic terms. So if I have, as I did on the previous slide here, 
an equation for, that determines the toroidal angular momentum and hence the toroidal rotation frequency, I have determined the radioelectric field. The radioelectric field and the toroidal angular momentum are not independent. They are locked together on the, uh, anything longer than an alphane time scale. So then I can say, well, so I know the toroidal rotation frequency, flux surface average, and I get the radioelectric field. I just use the relation. And then I can ask, well, what then is the net radial particle transport? Well, it's all the ambipolar ones, all the autom automatically ambipolar ones, plus the non-ambipolar ones evaluated at the electric field that comes out of the toroidal momentum balance equation. And so you get, this determines it. It turns out that, you know, when you have two big terms canceling to try to make zero, you usually use another process if you can. <laughs> and so the natural, tend to naturally cancel. That's the, uh, what's called the ion root, namely that um, the, the, the J dot grad rho, the radial current is approximately an ion thing. And so more or less that determines the radial electric field. So you have the intrinsically, so then you can say the net transport is the intrinsically ambipolar stuff plus the non-ambipolar stuff evaluated at the electric field that forces you to ambipolarity. So you could evaluate electrons or ions, but you know, it turns out electrons is easier. So then when you get all through with this, you end up saying, well, look, my, den my density equation looks like this. It's the time rate of change of V prime rho or density times the poloidal flux may be moving on you and the net particle flux that we had. And the net particle flux has a collision induced banana plateau and all that stuff, uh, fluctuation stuff, or microturbulence, which is usually the big one, banana plateau, paleoclassical diffusion pinch, and, and electromagnetic stress, and then the toroidal rotation, and so forth. And in addition to this density equation, um, your electron and ion energy or entropy uh, have equations that are similar to that. So here's the final transport equations. Now, um, it turns out that this first term in each of these, so V prime here is the radial derivative of the volume of a flux surface per unit change in rho. Um, and uh, then dn d rho would be the number of particles between the V surface and the V plus delta rho surface, the rho and the rho plus delta rho surface. And uh, likewise, the collisional entropy is, uh, this is, notice that's pressure times V prime to the five thirds. This looks familiar from the ideal equation of uh, uh, gas law, ideal gas law, you know, PV to the gamma, okay? This is PV to the gamma. So basically, all these are the usual isentropic uh, 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 characteristics, and everything else is then entropy producing processes, plus a little, the flux surfaces are moving on me. And um, anyway, uh, but then my Reynolds, oh, I didn't get that in red, but anyway, my Reynolds stress are my fluctuations here. But my momentum equation has these J cross B and divergence of pi stuff, in addition to the Reynolds stress, and these we'll talk about next time due to the 3D effects. And there's some quasi-classical and stuff, but, and there are these closures that need to be uh, worked on. And they're actually an interesting subject nowadays. So this approach uh, of trying to put all this together uh, for our codes, and we'll see how it all works out or if people start using it. Anyway, you first solve for the flows in the flux surfaces, and you derive uh, the particle fluxes, and you get transport equations for the toroidal rotation, and then that determines your electric field. The effects of the microturbulence come in in Ohm's law, uh, probably too small to count, it turns out. Poloidal ion flow may be important. Um, particle fluxes uh, as to the non-ambipolar parts, momentum transport, and electric field, and all that's included self-consistently in this process. And then you have poloidal flux transport. And what I would say is, okay, one of the other things that many of the 
um, gyrokinetic and drift kinetic analyses is presently done, they assume nice, you know, nested flux surfaces. Well, what about if I got an island in there? Or I got reconnecting field lines, little things like that. Oh, hmm. Well, O means that uh, I would say we should learn to have the output of our M3D, Nimrod, Jorik, et cetera, extended MHD codes will give us the magnetic field. And uh, so anyway, the, 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 my key point is, key points are that the radioelectric field is now determined self-consistently, and that determines ambipolar density transport. I think the magnetic microturbulence should be determined from a Chapman and Scott Champion, Chapman <laughs> and Scott kinetic equation so that the closures and transport they are introduce are consistent with the net transport equations they're going to be used in, paleoclassical stuff's included, and poloidal flux is included. So what I've tried to tell you about today is again collisional moments in the extended MHD equations, this stuff up here. Um, uh, we need to have these closures. Uh, in tokamak uh, MHD, we need the parallel viscous forces. And in the extended MHD and tokamak transport equations, uh, we're still developing for various applications. Experimentalists come up with, hey, I got a new type of magnetic perturbation I'm put on, putting on, what's it going to do? So we have to come up with a new closure often, but anyway. And the research topics uh, is, uh, to me, are how do we going to cons... Uh, resolve these singular responses that, however, evolve on fluid moment time scales, long fluid moment. And uh, as uh, our uh, organizer Boniface says, don't give me these flux surface averages. I want a local quantity, and so we've, we've got to do some work on that. And also, uh, we avoid, I've avoided, I've been on the flux surfaces inside uh, the separatrix, and I've avoided the X point and we need a better description. We need descriptions we can handle the diverter X point and, and actually below that. So next time what I'll try to tell you about is uh, some multiple examples. I won't talk really about microturbulence. I'll leave this to Eric <laughs> and uh, uh, Javier's talk yesterday. Um, but I would suggest as a general thing that I'll come back next time, a general procedure we can, okay. You may well have gotten out of all these lectures Vladimir's in particular in mind. Um, we have to have a multiple approach. We need some kinetics and we need some fluid. And we need to have a consistent picture from all of it. If you imagine you'd like to have one code, and that's probably beyond the pale and maybe we don't want to do that, but at some point we ought to have it understand how to make it consistent. And I would say, I propose that we want an extended MHD code to do macroscopic plasma uh, responses and magnetic field structure, including you know, reconnections of field lines in the plasma and in magnetic islands and X points and everything. And then we turn that over to the gyrokinetic chapman enskog glide kinetic equation to calculate a perturb, a kinetic distortion of the distribution function in whatever that magnetic field is. And then we obtain from that distribution collisional and collisional moments, and then we iterate back to here, and this gives us a grand unified toroidal simulation. We have guts. Anyway, thank you for your attention. We'll see if you survive. <laughs>
I, I would say just uh, come up with uh, these uh, rental stresses and you, you know the particular things that I had down there instead of, and use a Chapman Enskog like procedure, which doesn't produce any currents and doesn't produce any magnetic perturbation. That may not be the best way. Oh. <laughs> you asked a question yesterday and I forgot to answer. Well, I, I, let me, no, no, let me answer that though. Okay, in the paper that I referred to here, the one in 2010, I got a copy of it and I reminded myself. And basically, usually you think of joule heating as E dot J. It turns out it's the same. It's roughly speaking, it's it, with the bootstrap current. It's still E dot J, but the E is not the to, not eta total J. It's eta J minus J bootstrap. So the bootstrap current does not do any joule heating. Is kind of the way to say it. Okay. So my question for today. <laughs> okay. So here B is saying the global velocity. Mm -hmm. so yes. Oh. And it's a small parameter and so on and so forth. And my question is, uh, is it the, 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 does this small parameter, does it have, have, have interest for all this discussion of looking at, at all these terms one after the other? <laughs> um. I prefer to start really with the ideal MHG for one thing. Mm. Um. Well, first, I might say the, uh, the gyrokinetic in various of those forms often do scaling analyses with mass ratios that are different than the, the real ones. I'm a, I'm a faithful tokamak guy here. The mass ratio is 3,672. <laughs> um, I don't know quite how to answer that. Uh, it, what I would say is that... Um, uh, certainly from a theoretical and pedagogical perspective, seeing some of those scalings, uh, uh, or some of those, uh, how some of these things would change with mass ratio would be quite interesting. But what I would generally say is as long as the mass ratio difference between electrons and ions is over a factor of 100 or something, you, you, you tend to get separation enough of time scales so that you're still in the same regime. You may not have to go to 3672 to make it happen, but as long as you get to 100 or so, I don't know. Vladimir, you, have you thought about that same question? Uh, it's a kinetic simulation. It's a current uh, situation, and you're reducing mass ratio to accelerate effects. The only thing you should be cautious that you're not touching other small parameters. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. Which often happens. Yeah. But in our case, most of the time, if you're greater than 100 or so, I think you, you, separate, you keep separate enough. But you might run into some, and you're right. You have to worry about it. Example, for example, if you go in a strong relativistic plasma, oh. part of a gamma, which could be a big para small, small parameter when you're talking acceleration in uh, relativistic uh, uh, cosmic rays. Yeah, oh, yeah, right. Then it's clear, it depends which ratio, mass ratio, is the problem. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, just last question. Before. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so in your scheme here, uh, grass Shafran equation is not show up. Is it, <laughs> you think it's just the starting point of your iteration? Passage? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Um, and, and yes, basically, it, it's established on the compressional alphane wave time, and so. Then you started from this. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. So, so I have a question for that. Can it be the ending point of the transport equation? The crash Can it be the end point? Um, um, <laughs> you, 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 you get into an iteration um, in the sense that in the uh, transport equation, uh, I put in sources and um, they will cause, 
Now, some of those sources will cause current changes or pressure, pressure changes, and then I have to do the grad shafranoff equation again for those changed pressure and currents because the grad shafranoff equation depends upon the pressure, pressure profile and the current profile. But in practice, those are usually pretty small. So we have a break for 20 minutes. Hmm. Thank you. Thank you.